Welcome to the Quantum Biology Collective Podcast, where we break down the practical strategies of this emerging science, starting with healthy light habits and going wherever the quantum superhighway takes us. This is your host, executive and life coach, Meredith Oak, with a quick reminder that podcasts are conversations, not consultations, and definitely not medical advice. We're here for informational purposes only. To follow up with our amazing guests, please do check out the show notes and to stay in the loop with the QBC podcast, join our email list, also linked in the show notes. So our eyes are the windows to our souls, and they are also the window to our entire circadian operating system. We are going deep into the eyeball today with our amazing guest, Valerie Giangrande, who is an optometrist with 20 years experience in private practice. She is also an integrative health coach, and she has graduated from the Applied Quantum Biology Certification. So Valerie has been studying the quantum approach to eye health for many years, and she is going to explain to us all of the ways that we need to think about our eyes, what is going on with our eyeballs, and why it is so, so important that we take care of them and think about the types of light and the types of frequency that we are exposing our eyes to. Um, and on that topic, if you are interested in doing a deep dive and becoming a practitioner like Valerie is, incorporating all of this into your existing practice, we are accepting applications at our partner organization, the Institute of Applied Quantum Biology. The next certification uh, cohort kicks off in September. So there's links in the show notes quantumbiologycollective.org. Uh, please fill out an application if you're interested. We would love to hear from you and give you some more information. Um, it's just so humbling and awe-inspiring to me, the work that is being put out into the world by practitioners who have you know, experience and, and deep training in an area, and then they layer this lens on top, and the work that they're doing is really quite phenomenal. You are all blowing my mind, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we dive in, a quick reminder that if you haven't yet purchased protective eyewear for your precious, precious eyeballs, uh, I recommend checking out Bond Charge at bondcharge.com. If you enter the discount code QBC at checkout, you will receive 15% off. Um, Andy Mant is the founder there. He's going to be on the podcast uh, next month. And he has uh, really paid close attention to making high quality um, blue blocking glasses. He makes them. They're made in Australia. They're not outsourced to China. So, And they're also very cute. So if you don't have any after you listen to this episode, you're really, really going to want some because Valerie explains so beautifully and so clearly and in such detail um, what's going on with our eyes. So without further ado, here we go. All right, Valerie Gian Grande, I am so excited to talk to you about quantum eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Meredith. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> All right. So you are um, an optician by training. An optometrist, yes. Optometrist, mm -hmm. a practicing optometrist. Yes. Um, tell me about your journey from being a standard optometrist to yeah. someone who's telling their their clients or patients to uh, go outside and get lots of sunlight. Absolutely. How that happens. Absolutely. Um, so I've been in practice for about 20 years, uh, just conventional, uh, conventional optometry. And I started, I had kids. Um, when my son was four, uh, this was in he's now 16. So okay. when he was four, he started to get some issues, some health issues, like neurological issues that weren't making any sense. And we were getting extremely concerned. Uh, of course, we went to the, the um, pediatrician, what can we do? And I remember saying to the pediatrician, could this have anything to do with the food he's eating? And I started to think about things maybe that were causing it. Of course, they said, no, let's give him medication. I said, yeah, I'm not ready to really want to medicate my four-year-old. And so I found uh, functional medicine. So we went down that rabbit hole, which was great. We ended mm -hmm. up finding ways to take, um, remove toxins and to take out gluten, dairy, that whole, that whole rabbit hole. And we started using supplements and we had some really big improvements. So I started to become more holistic and I saw how much that helped. 
And then I had my own health issues, a few things that were going on. So I went to my own doctor, a functional medicine doctor. And when I went in there, he said, you know, how much sunshine do you get? And I said, sunshine, I, I wear my sunglasses. I, I block the sun. You know, that's what I'm trained to do. That's what we're supposed to do. And he said, you know, that's that's your biggest problem. You have to get some sunshine. And then I saw that he, um, I was actually following him on Facebook, and I saw that he was following someone named Jack Cruz. And, and of course, that rabbit hole, you see who this amazing doctor is and, and what he's what he's talking about. And it just changes everything. And as you know, once you learn about this quantum world, it just it, it just I learned as much as I can. And it changed everything for us. And then I started to see the world in a quantum view. And you start to see that all of these eye conditions are, are related to light for the most part, because everything is related to that quantum. So I start um, I've started educating patients since this has been since probably since 2018. I, I, I really talk, talk about light with as many patients as I can. And I will say some people don't want to hear it, but some people do and they really resonate. And, and I've seen some in, interesting improvements over the years. So I just think it's such a good foundation for health. And I absolutely love it. <laughs> oh, amazing. And how cool that you went to a doctor <laughs> who right? was like, get some sunlight. Get some sunlight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny. I was like, when I was, um, you know, in my, in my teens and twenties, I was fanat I was a fanatical S SPF person. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm fair. I'm very light skin. I got to never burn. You know, I was like, I'm going to follow the rules to the ends of the yeah. earth. And for me, I went to, um, get a facial from this like 65 year old Hungarian woman who was trained in the old country. And mm -hmm. she was like, you'll need sun. <laughs> Sun is life. And I was like, what? And she was like, you need lie out in the sun, preferably naked. And I just like, she was so forceful about it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't understand anything about circadian rhythms or anything like that. But from that point on, I really relaxed my approach to the sun. And I think maybe I'm like, I think that lady saved my life. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Just we hear these. We, and, the, and the interesting thing is like when someone says that about the sun, like it feels true. You're like, it does. It does. Oh, yeah. You know, you wear sunglasses and you just feel like you're hiding. You know, you're, you're kind of sheltered from the world and you take them off and it's it's a shock. But it's just so much. You just feel so connected. You know, when you finally are able to take off those sunglasses, and I know when I say that, people get really offended. Uh, you know, it's it's a big thing. Yeah, to, they hear people, really hate the sunglasses they thing. Do, they do, and um, yeah, I, you know, I, I of course explain why, and it usually it, it, people start getting used to it. But oh my gosh, it's crazy <laughs> how much how yeah. hard it is to be. No, I was surprised because, like, I I you know. Uh, I'm like, oh, you know, if you're going to watch, you know, we watch TV at night, we wear blue blockers or whatever. And mm -hmm. people are like, oh, really? Okay. And they're like, but you're like, yeah, you probably shouldn't wear sunglasses unless you're like out on a boat or something. They're like, what? <laughs> I'm not taking off my sunglasses. That's crazy. It is. It is. I, I will say my, my colleagues are probably don't appreciate it, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it, it's it's important. You know, it really is at least at least at specific times of the day. We need to. We really need to. Right. So let's, okay, so let's mm -hmm. get into why. So we're talking here about our eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And I got to be honest, like, I think most of us don't really think about our eyes that much unless they're giving us issues. We're just, right. we just go about our day. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us, like, from a quantum and a circadian perspective, what are our eyes doing and what's happening with them when we optimize our light okay. environment? Sure. So our eyes, we're not just meant to see with our eyes. We have a lot of cells in our eyes that are actually waiting for specific signals of light. And what I tell patients is we're, we're wired for sunshine. So our eyes, we have these cells um, that are waiting for a, a, the perfect light, that sunrise. When the sun is rising, it's a very soothing mix of that blue and red and infrared. And we have cells in our eye that are waiting for that particular signal of blue. And when we get that signal through our eyes, that light we'll send a message to our clock in our brain to say it's morning. And we physically need that light to tell our brain it's morning. And once that clock is activated, now we can start our day. We start releasing our cortisol and, our, and all of our hormones in the correct order and we wake up. And then when the sun's rising, there's, there's all different things that happen. We have some ultraviolet light that starts to show up and we've been conditioned to be so afraid of ultraviolet light. And that's the thing where people feel like they need their sunglasses. 
And what I tell people is we actually need a little bit of that ultraviolet light, especially when it's rising, because our eyes are making hormones. And we have cells in our eyes. Um, we actually have receptors on the front surface, right on the cornea, called neuropsin, that are waiting for ultraviolet A light to, to make hormones in our eyes. It's amazing. So our eyes are a hormone-making organ. We have cells for UVA, and we have amino acids in our eyes that are also waiting to collect this ultraviolet light. And when we collect this light, those hormones, um, those amino acids will, will actually turn into precursors for hormones. So we're making our melatonin just from light in the morning. We're making dopamine. We're making serotonin. We're making um, melanin so we can get some sun. We're making norepinephrine and all of these amazing hormones that regulate the entire body um, through the, you know, from the eyes to the brain and then to the body. And when we're wearing sunglasses, we don't get that at all. So what I tell people is when we're just inside all day and we're exposed to these, these signals of light that don't exist. So, so we're talking about LEDs and computers and screens. All of those lights, are, they're not natural lights. They're considered you know, blue light because they just have a single spectrum of light that's the same color temperature as 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So if we wake up in the morning and we're turning on these artificial lights, the brain goes right to 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So you can imagine this shot of cortisol and we just have this level of this 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we're supposed wearing sunglasses and, and our body has no idea what time it is. And then we're inside all day. If we're on screens all day, we just have this one time set because our eyes are just getting the same signal. And then at night when the sun goes down, our brain and our bodies, we're expecting to see darkness because that's a natural rhythm. That's how we're wired to be part of nature, light during the day and darkness at night. So when we have darkness at, when we're not exposed to darkness at night and we still have these lights on, this is where it becomes the most damaging because again, that light is a 12 o'clock timestamp for the brain. So at night when the body's saying, I really am getting tired or I wish I, I'd like to go to sleep, let's, let's release that melatonin that we made from that ultraviolet light in the morning. Um, but, you know, I still see a 12 o'clock signal, so it must be daytime. So then we release cortisol all over again and, and all of those other hormones that go along with it. So at night, now we're left with this high level of cortisol. Maybe we get this um, extra energy that we're not supposed to have. We get hungry. Our blood sugar can go up. It can, you know, increase um, diabetes and blood pressure and all the other uh, issues that go along with just having our hormones not in sync. And that melatonin cannot be released from the brain because our eyes are getting the wrong signal. So our eyes are controlling the entire body with light. Our body works with light. That's our and that's our communication. So um, when our melatonin doesn't get released from the brain, we don't sleep as well. And melatonin is such a beautiful thing because it actually heals our body while we're sleeping. So I say to people, it's, it's cleaning up all the mess we did during the day for the most part. You know, while we're sleeping, it's repairing our body. So we need that melatonin to be released, but only when we're getting darkness. So most of us are just living in this modern world where our body has no idea what time it is. And it all starts with our eyes. So sunglasses are going to just block that signal. And it's, it's, a, it's a big shame that a lot of health issues are happening just from our light environment because our eyes are getting the wrong signal of light all day long and night. Wow. Thank you for that very succinct and clear explanation. That's really, really helpful. And I I just want to reflect on a statement that you made towards the beginning of that answer where you said, our eyes are hormone-making organs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I just want to say it again slowly because that is not how we think about our eyes, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. What an absolute revelation to think it, about it. That it way. is. It's amazing. Um, I mean, all, so many so many things happen. And, and just imagine what happens to our bodies when we're blocking that signal. It's just, we're not making hormones. I mean, it's controlling the entire body, really. And we can make some of it in our skin, but even our skin, most people aren't exposed to the sun, you know, with our skin either. But it's really the eyes that are the, the connection from, it connects our light to our body and helps us work the way we're designed to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and this applies to everybody to both sexes, to everyone right. of all ages. But I do mm -hmm. want to talk about uh, women for a moment, women who are trying to get pregnant, women who are in peri or perimenopause yeah. or menopause, right? Yes. And it's like our hormones are really on our minds a lot. Or And even men, you know, as they head towards their 50s and their testosterone mm -hmm. starts to drop, like our hormones, like we're thinking about it a lot. It is a big topic of conversation Absolutely. and nobody Nobody, right. I mean, outside of our little bubble. right outside, <laughs> nobody <laughs> thinks about the fact right. that our eyeballs mm -hmm. 
are driving There's, a lot of that. Absolutely. And it's it's just so fascinating. And I just I just want to scream it to the world. I don't even want everybody to know just gosh, just go outside. <laughs> That's it. Go yeah. outside, block your light at night. Yeah. And there's other things, of course. But Teenagers, you know where their, their hormones are all coming mm -hmm. online. They're going through adolescence. I mean, oh, it's gosh. just... So simple. It's just so, so important. simple and so mm -hmm. important. And we just are not thinking mm -hmm. about it that way. Absolutely. Our eyes are hormone-making organs. Right. I'm going <laughs> to get a billboard. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So we've talked about what happens when we mm -hmm. mess up that signal. So right. let's so let's talk about uh, what happens when we get it right. Okay. So when we get it right and we have the exact signals of light. So when I'm talking about the clock in our brain, so the, the, the early morning signal starts the clock in our brain and starts that hormone cascade where we're um, starting our cortisol and all these steroid hormones that should be in the correct order. And then uh, with that UVA, again, we're getting the other hormones that are modulating everything. Now, what's happening is that light is actually powering up our mitochondria. So our mitochondria cells are, are, are um, they run by light. You know, the electrons that are being used as a currency in our body is that signal of, of voltage in our body is all powered by light. So when we talk about mitochondria, we really need our mitochondria to be working well. And, and a lot of um, when we're dysregulated with light, a lot of that can go wrong. So when we talk about mitochondria, we're also talking about the water that gets made. Um, I don't know if we want to go into that, but our light is controlling our mitochondria, which is making helping our body make the um, beautiful water that that uh, covers everything in our body. It, it, it and actually, just quickly, why is that so important? Okay, so that's actually our voltage. That's actually what allows our body to communicate with light throughout the entire body. It's like the super highway at the speed of light. Just think of our body as this whole um, conductive organ. The entire body is all connected with this beautiful water that gets activated um, by the mitochondria, which is activated by light. So it's all connected. We just are, are working with light and electrons and voltage, and we need a lot of energy. And we get that energy from, again, getting the correct light signals. And when everything's in the right order, we are hungry in the morning. We have energy. Energy in the afternoon, you know, we have energy as the day goes on. At the end of the day, we're supposed to not eat so we could relax or rest our body and, and we get some good sleep. And, and all of that, when it's working properly, our hormones are intact, our body, our blood pressure is working, and our vitamin D levels are good. You know, everything is working the way it's supposed to when we get those correct, correct signals, when we're eating at the correct time, when we're doing everything in sync with nature. But again, it all starts with our eyes. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it sure, it okay. sure did. It sure did. And so along with like really rethinking how our bodies function. So we're now we're thinking about our eyes as hormone making organs. And we're mm -hmm. thinking about our bodies as like an electrical signaling system or liquid crystal signaling system, <laughs> as opposed to, uh, you know, a bunch of parts that were right. welded together in a factory. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And what I love about um, the eyes is that it's 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 kind of it's like a window into the body. You know, since everything's connected, the eyes are an extension of the skin. They have mucous membranes. There's nerve tissue. It's all, it's brain tissue. It's cardiovascular tissue. It's lymph tissue. And it's everything all together. And when people come in and they have dry eyes or, or a condition, and they say, "Give me a drop. I need a drop to heal. You know, to help." And and a lot of times I'll say, "You know, I, I can give you a drop. It's only going to help your symptoms for a short time. We need to fix your environment. We need to fix your light. And if we really want to heal, your body has to be, uh, you know, your environment has to be correct." So a lot of people are looking for that quick fix, and that's not how it works. But th that's one thing I do love about the eyes is that you can kind of get a clue of what's happening in the entire body and and, and try to help. From a holistic standpoint. Right. Mm -hmm. So so a s seemingly small symptom like dry eyes could actually, is actually like an indica indicator of a larger systemic Correct. issue that we can catch early if we listen to it. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And do you find, how do you find people respond to that? Because they're, they haven't necessarily been listening to these podcasts, right. or, you know, they're just coming in. Are they compliant? And when they are, what type of results do you so, see? So I have to be, I could tell who wants to hear it and who doesn't. I, I always, yeah. I always have a little blurb about it. I always say, say, you know, we really need to make sure we're not getting too much blue at night. We're getting sunshine in the morning. I kind of say a little bit pretty quickly and I kind of see if someone is interested and if they're interested, I will, I will full flesh. I'll go into all of it, but you can tell some people are very resistant. So I have to be a little 
careful. Mm-hmm. And the people that are resistant, I try again next year. People who are really into it and, and resonates, and it does resonate with quite a few people, they come back and they say, you know, I stopped, I wore my blue light glasses and I'm feeling better and I get my sun every morning and I open my windows in the morning and I'm feeling better. Dry eyes is one of the things that really does improve pretty quickly. Like I, it's not necessarily, it's not very easy to, to you know, reverse floaters or things that are a little more serious, but dry eyes is one of the most, probably one of the most common issues. And it is a, a, something that can be very well Im, um, improved by circadian rhythm, proper circadian rhythm. It's amazing. It's really cool. Okay. So let, let's talk about dry eyes. Cause okay. I have to say that is something we, you know, we, we get emails and comments, mm-hmm. on the, you know, from the, people listening and a lot dry eyes is one of the most common things that people ask about. Absolutely. So let's from your perspective, sort of what is it, what's going on with the eye? And then we talk about okay. how to help. So when we talk about dry eyes, we talk about our tear film. Our tear film is actually made of three different parts. So we have a mucus layer, we have a water layer and we have an oil layer. So we have okay. glands on our eyelids. They're called. And my- the tear film is like, what's just like it's why our bathing- eyeballs look a bit wet all the time. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Our tear film is what is what protects and bathes our eye. The tear film is full of um, microbiome. It has all these nutrients that bathe our eyes. So when our eyes are dry, it can really have a big problem. It's, it's like a windshield wiper. If the windshield wiper is not smooth, we're not going to see as well. We need we need everything to be, not that a windshield wiper is moist, but it has to be clear. It has to be moist. Yeah. That's what keeps us um, healthy, basically, our eyes healthy. Yeah, because the windshield has to be moist. Otherwise, it's just like sticky. Right, exactly. It yeah, has to be okay. nice and smooth. So we have that right. oil layer. So the oil layer, okay. every time we blink in a perfect world, that oil gets pumped out of these glands. They're my bobian glands on our eyelids and it stays in place for about 10 seconds. And then we have our water layer and our mucus layer. So those three layers are, are in our eyes for about 10 seconds and the body is designed to blink every 10 seconds. It's perfect. So it's mm-hmm. just such a nice system. So we blink in 10 seconds and the oil layer is refreshed and we stay nice and moist and we blink every 10 seconds. And when we look under the microscope, we actually use this glowing um, fluorescein dye and we use this light that glows and we kind of count. It's called the tear breakup time. And we look under the microscope and we say blink and open and just stay there. And you kind of count how many seconds it takes for their tears to break up. And you see most people's tears will break up really quickly, four seconds, five seconds, all of a sudden you see everything breaking up and it's drying out. But if we're only blinking every 10 seconds, it dries out. Now, if we're on a computer, the blink rate goes down even more. So just being on a screen, even aside from all the quantum stuff, just being on a screen and staring, our blink rate goes down. So you can imagine being in front of a computer will automatically dry our eyes just from a, just from a standpoint of blinking. But anyway. So when so you we, say our blink rate goes down, does that mean we have to blink more often to keep we, our eyes moist? We do, but it's not something okay. we think about. You know, it's not, it's, it's right. so hard to remember. If we remember to blink all day, we won't, you know, it's, it's hard to remember that. But if we can remember, yes. But it is so a really we hard. we want to blink more often. We want to blink more often. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, because this is interesting, because so sometimes when I'm editing this podcast, right, like there's a lot of video of me just listening, mm-hmm. not talking. Right. And I look at it sometimes and I'm like, God, <laughs> I blink a lot. Like, is this sped up? Because I feel like I'm just sitting there going, but... Then I'm like, it's you know okay. what? I'm going to ask Valerie because I mm-hmm. am staring at a screen right. quite right. intently because I'm listening to, to, to people. Mm-hmm. I do have an extra light on. I don't normally have yeah. on for, for the during right. the podcast. So yeah, you're saying you need my to blink. blink rate is speeding up to compensate for the fact that the Absolutely. screen is drying out my eyes faster. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's actually a good thing. Interesting. So those three layers, so if any of those three layers are disrupted, we're going to get dry eyes. So we have um, the lacrimal glands are making water and the goblet cells make mucus. All of those cells, um, the, the glands, the uh, lacrimal glands, all of them, they're all, they all have clock genes. They're all based on time. They, they're also related to hormones. So if we have a poor light environment, the first thing that can go wrong is that we start having some medical issues, perhaps hormonal dysregulation. Some We can get autoimmune issues from that blue light at night or um, high blood pressure, diabetes. All of those health issues end up creating inflammation, hormonal issues. Everything can actually disrupt some of those layers and then you can get dry eyes that way. You can have dry eyes from the medication side effects from the circadian mismatch of getting some health issues and then on these prescription medications and they automatically, they all have dry eyes as a side effect. For the most part, most people are on those blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, and and they they tend to have dryness just as a side effect. Um, You can get 
so that's hormonal. And now if we actually talk about light in general. So when we're lacking, um, so blue light by itself will actually is very dehydrating for the body because it's just that single spectrum of blue with nothing balancing it out. It's very oxidizing and it's damaging. So when we're staring at that, that's enough to dehydrate our mitochondria. So we're not making enough of uh, enough of that healthy water. The collagen, the cornea is a layer of collagen. And we know that collagen needs to be hydrated in order for us to be healthy. And that collagen is full of that special exclusion zone water. So anything that dehydrates the body, we're talking about blue light, we're talking about Wi-Fi signals, um, a lack of ultraviolet light, a lack of sunshine will dehydrate that water. And that also contributes to dry eyes. Now, ultra UVA light, when I say the eye is a hormone making organ, that neuropsin, those neuropsin cells are on the cornea. We're meant to absorb some of that ultraviolet light. If we're covering it up with sunglasses, we're not getting that. If we're covering it up with contacts all the time, we're not getting that as well for the most part. Um, so that's a problem. Now, ultraviolet light will also help us make nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is actually what dilates our blood vessels and helps with blood flow and nutrient flow throughout the body. So we need that. Um, ultraviolet A light also helps us make a melanin, which is also very um, protective for our bodies in general, and including the eyes. We have red light that's part of the sun naturally that we're lacking when we're just getting that blue. Red light is going to be the antidote to that oxidative stress um, that can actually help with dryness. But when we're lacking it, again, our mitochondria is not able to make all that water. Um, lymph the conjunctiva, the white part of the eye, is full of lymph vessels. And lymph is uh, can very easily get stagnant when we're dehydrated because, again, that, that water that's lining the vessels isn't there, uh, isn't full enough to push all that lymph through the body. So a lot of people get these puffy eyes. They get a lot of dryness around the white part of the eye. Um, that contributes to dryness. We have... Um, Allergies can contribute to dryness. And again, histamine is a reaction when we're de dehydrated as well on that cellular level. We can get more histamine. Melatonin, this is probably one of the most important things. When we're not making enough melatonin and releasing enough melatonin at night, we're not, we're not healing our bodies. We're not sleeping. So when we're not sleeping, our tear film is not being... Um, protected or you know if you don't sleep if you ever have a night of poor sleep usually feel it in the eyes the eyes get very dry we yeah. need to sleep to heal our, our eyes and then there's also the vitamin d component there's actually vitamin d receptors in all parts of the eye so we need that vitamin d to keep us healthy we need melatonin to keep us healthy melatonin is actually made throughout the day as well just from infrared light in the sun which is always present and that infrared light will also help expand that um, hydration inside of our bodies and it also helps make melatonin locally in the mitochondria, so we can, it's, it's an antioxidant, it's a local antioxidant. So we need all of those things to be in place to be, to, to have healthy eyes. There's also a microbiome in the eye, and that microbiome is also linked to light. So when we have that, again, ultraviolet light is what helps us make a good microbiome. Okay, so all you're going to have to expand on that. There's a <laughs> microbiome in the eye. Tell yes, me just more. Like, well, just like there's a microbiome on our skin. Um, there's, the tear film has a, a microbiome. There's healthy bacteria in the eyes. You know, so it's 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 something that we have to be. It, I don't know the exact comp composition of it, but we all have our own microbiome, and again, that protects us. So our tears okay. are, you know, antiviral. They're anti-inflammatory. They, when we have a good tear film, we really are healthy. But little things that 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 disrupt it can can have a huge effect. You can get really blurry. You can have referred pain. You can have headaches, light sensitivity. I mean, it's a big problem. Dry eyes, and there's no real yeah. fix. People say, you know, can I have a an eye drop? I'm like, I can give you an eye drop, but it's it's really not going to solve the problem. Right. You know, temporarily. It's yes. not, yeah. If you're in front of a screen mm -hmm. inside and wearing sunglasses outside, that sounds like an absolute recipe absolutely. For, dry, for dry eyes amongst absolutely. other things. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. So, okay. I'll tell, so yeah. the dry eyes can be triggered by uh, medication. It can be triggered by allergies. It can be mm -hmm. triggered by lack of sleep. And it mm -hmm. can be triggered and exacerbated by having the wrong kind of light hit our right. eyeballs directly and the healthy light blocked off with Correct. contacts or sunglasses. Correct. Correct. What about just like regular glasses to see? Uh, so regular glasses, even if they're not UV blocking, it, it does block some of that signal. I think plastic in general can have a lot of UV blocking, but you know, with glasses, if you pull them down a little bit and you're outside, a lot of the sun can get through so you can pull them okay. down. Um, I mean, there are some contacts that do let UV light through, which might be a little bit. Oh, yeah. Let's let's okay. say the names of those. Those are always a big. OK, there's not question. too many of them. So there's as far as daily lenses, the only um, daily's total one does not block UV. 
but Daly's total for astigmatism and Daly's total for multi for uh, presbyopia does block UV. So only if okay. you don't have an astigmatism and you don't need reading, those Daly's total one do not block UV. Uh, same thing with air. The same company makes an uh, air optics a Daly's Aqua Comfort that also doesn't block UV. That's very. Those are the only Daly's that I know of. There's a few okay. monthlies that don't block UV. There's Biofinity from a company called Cooper Vision that does not block UV, and um, I'm drawing a blank if there's any others because there's so few. I will okay. say most of well, them. Well, we can we can throw it in the show notes. Yeah, I, I have a I have a document that I made that I can oh. I can send to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll send, yeah, well, we can send people to you and then okay. get that document because, yeah, that's, that's a okay. big question that people have because we're, I mean, we're so backwards on this that I, you know, all of these companies purposely created lenses that block mm -hmm. UV thinking they were being helpful. They boast about it. And they also, some of them are now blocking blue light, which again, they think they're doing a good thing in a way. I mean, I guess it would mm -hmm. help for the daytime, but we, we're not supposed to block blue light from the sun. We need it. That's, that's how we... That's how yes. we wake up. And, and when it's balanced by the sun, it's not dangerous. It's the artificial unbalanced blue that's that's so bad for us. And it's very, it's just bad. You're right. It's very short-sighted. Um, the other thing about contacts, even if you're wearing a contact, it does allow UV to come through. I find that the problem with contacts is that people overwear them and, and it's disrupting mm. the tear film. So no matter how much oxygen or how moist these contacts are, it's still something on the eye. So, you know, people who wear contacts for, you know, they come in and they, they say, oh, I can't wear my contacts anymore, but I've been able to wear them for the last 15, 20 years and I've been fine. I said, well, over time, your body like rejects them. Right. You start getting these bumps on the eyelids, these calluses, and you yeah. just, you have to cut down the time that you're using them, really. I, I, that's usually what I say. If someone really wants contacts, yeah. then you just cut, cut down the time. Take them out the second okay. you get in the house. Don't wear them in the morning. You know, just try to wear them. Yeah. But not, not for too so long. If you did, so if you do, you know, for work or whatever, you really mm -hmm. want to wear contacts, It we, we want to go outside in the morning before we put them in. Correct. Correct. And, and uh, if you can also get that UVA rise also about an hour after right. sunrise, that's really hard. It's hard in the winter if you're in a seasonal climate because that's sometimes yeah. pretty late. But so, like, could you keep them in your bag, go to drive to work with the window open, yes. put the contacts in and the bathroom at work? You can. People and don't want to do your that, day. I know they don't want to do that. But <laughs> that, that's ideal. That would be perfect. Right. Yeah be much better and then if someone's open to it would they were just like i'll do whatever you say what would you recommend just glasses so i would rec i would recommend what you just said about contacts but i also like to get little sun breaks outside throughout the day because again mm -hmm. that morning signals are those morning signals are important um but we also need to get in the middle of the day it's, it's we, yeah. especially if we're exposed to that blue we need to balance that out with that full spectrum um in seasonal climates again that uvb light that really strong ultraviolet light in the middle of the day as long as we've already gotten that morning sunshine and we've been able to build up that tolerance to the sun that's how we make our vitamin d so if we're inside all day we need a way to make some vitamin d so to get outside you have to take your contacts out if you want to make vitamin d we can't we're, if we're if we're blocking the signal of the sun, that ultraviolet signal through our eyes, our skin doesn't will burn. Our skin needs the same signal. Our brain has to know what's happening in the sun for our skin to be able to make not burn and to make that vitamin D. And and that's the only way. So unfortunately, right. most people are getting sun and they have their sunglasses on or their contacts. And so I would say pop them out if you can, even if it's right. very annoying, but just get outside. Or, or pop, wear glasses instead. Or wear glasses and pull them contacts down. Contacts or just keep contacts for those high level moments where you really right. don't want glasses. Right. This is not going to be Because that's also another really, really good point that I will mm -hmm. be reminded me I wanted to cover, which is how creating a mismatch by wearing by wearing sunglasses outside and screens mm -hmm. inside uh, causes sunburn, right? Because I yeah. live in uh, the Northeast, and mm -hmm. so, so <laughs> yeah, okay. So about a month ago, yeah. right, that started to get warm. You see, I would go to pick up at school, and I see all the parents out, and they're like in their shorts and their flip flops. They're like pasty mm -hmm. white and like dark sunglasses. Sunglasses. Oh, you I guys know. are gonna burn. So Absolutely. I don't. I keep my mouth shut and just. Don't say anything. I, know, I wish I could if say someone that. said, what do you mean I'm going to burn from wearing my sunglasses? So, there, so the other thing when I was talking about the eye being a hormone making organ, um, ultraviolet light will also stimulate the body um, to make histamine and uracanic acid. Now, when we are exposed to sun on our skin, if we're getting the correct light signals through our eyes and we're making those, those, um, we have those receptors in our skin also, but we need the eyes to have the same system. 
when our sun, when the sun hits our skin and nitric oxide hits it, our vessels are dilated. So that those blood, the blood vessels will come to the surface because they're collecting light. That's what we need to, to, to be healthy. And when those blood vessels are dilated, if we've had too much sun, the body will release a hist histamine and that will c cause a pinkening of our skin. And that's just a beautiful way for them to say, OK, I had enough sun. And let's yeah. stop. So it's just this built-in mechanism. And uracanic acid is actually also um, something that the body makes to protect us from too much UV. And of course, the ultraviolet light that we're getting that, through our eyes is also helping us make melanin. Um, we make it in our skin also. But but if if our body thinks it's nighttime by wearing sunglasses, there's such a mismatch that we won't be making those reactions won't happen on our skin, and we won't even know that we're getting too much sun and we can burn. And melanin is oh gosh, melanin is so so important to really build up slowly. It's such a nice protective mechanism, which again doesn't tell us. Um, it's it's just amazing. The, the whole system is just, oh my god. Works okay, so well. I just I'm gonna recap on that okay. because this is so, so <laughs> no it but you're so clear it's so good um and i you know because like the you know this sunglasses thing like it's just such a sticking point right so mm -hmm. i just want to be clear like yes. wearing sunglasses stops our body mm -hmm. from stops our eyes from communicating with our skin right and so Basically, we do not do our skin is not going to respond to the sun the way it's meant to we're right. not going to notice that we're burning, right? And we're not going to create the melanin which we need, which is a which is a beneficial, like it's a health benefit of being outside. Correct. So we don't get the benefits, we don't get, and we don't get the warning signals. Correct. We're well, just I, I guess it would burn, but we're, we right, we wouldn't get the, right. We just burn instead of getting those warning. Yeah, we, instead of getting the warning signals, so we just be like, we oh, burn fast. like that happens. You're like, oh my god, how did I burn so fast? Like exactly. I was just outside for twenty minutes, exactly, and it's because we're not getting that. Mm -hmm. that built-in warning system. Correct. So we're going to end up with a sunburn when we don't mean to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. Just from wearing, just from Sun wearing dances. these little fashion accessories that we've no. become so emotionally we attached are. to. Oh my goodness. And I have to be careful because I, I, when I say no sunglasses, if you are on the water, like you said, yes. on a boat, if you're Good on the point. water, if you're skiing, if you're in a place where there's tons of reflection and like those like snow or, or water, Yes, too much UV. Yes, You're not good. And I, I yes, have to be absolutely. Careful. Yep, we and, do. And mm -hmm. and I think we were talking about it at family dinner recently. It was like that's how sunglasses became popular, right? It's like we're trying like pilots and right. people out on boats who had like these extreme bright conditions were wearing them, and then mm -hmm. you know, correct. And you know, if you're we all decided not. that that was good. <laughs> Yeah. If you feel unsafe driving and you need obviously to protect yourself while you're driving in, in the glare, yeah. then, then then that would be a good time also. But just if if you're not outside much and the only time you're outside you're wearing sunglasses, then don't wear them. If you're outside, if you're if you're in a, the tropics and you're outside all day, protect yourself from the sun. Of course, if it's too much, because too much is no good either. But we there's just so such a nice safe way to get that sun, and it does yeah. require no sunglasses. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And and yes, and to your point, like if if you're feeling eye strain, if you notice you're getting pink, like, mm -hmm. yeah, Perfect. shade up, shade yeah. up, put on a hat. Put on a hat. It's not like umbrella. we want to push our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies know. Our bodies know. And even if we're in the shade, we're still getting the benefit of that sunshine. You don't need direct. Yeah. And, and um, when I say get the sun, I'm not saying stare at the sun. Don't stare at the sun. But just being outside at that time. Yeah. And, and those those blue light receptors that we have in our eyes that are stimulated by that blue light, specifically that sunrise light that starts our day, the melanopsin receptors are at the bottom of our retina. So they're designed to be just being outside so the sun is coming in at an angle and hitting us down here. So we, you know, staring at it doesn't work as well as just being outside because it has to hit right. you on an angle anyway. So that's how we're designed, just to be outside at that time. To face the direction of the sun would be nice. But even if we're not in the sun, it doesn't matter. You know, I go for my walk right. and in this direction, I'm facing the sun, and I turn, and yeah, I'm not. You know, so turn it's the quarter, and right. you're in the shade, and, and it's but then you get all the nice and red light coming off the trees, Correct. and it's mm -hmm. all beautiful. But that is a really good point. Like when we say no sunglasses, we are talking about when, like, you're going outside for a walk. There's a mm -hmm. woman in my neighborhood. We live like on on this road. There's no sidewalks, or like right at the top. And God bless her. She's out there walking at least once a day, often twice a day. And it's during when I pick my kids up from school. So mm -hmm. I see her almost every day. Like this is a, she is a committed walker. It's very impressive. She always, always has sunglasses on. And I have to Same stop thing. myself from pulling the car over and Me being too. like, 
you would be proving the health benefits of this dedicated practice that you have cultivated. So funny. I actually just did it. I I put a little Instagram post the other day, like TSA, if you're, if you made a good choice to take your morning walk, please take your sunglasses off. But that same reason I walk with my friend down the block and and, and every morning we see this woman power walking, doing this great and and wearing her sunglasses and it's early. It's so early and I don't know her at all. And I wish I did. I wish I could tell her because I feel like, oh gosh, I feel so just frustrated for her. <laughs> Same thing. Yes. Cause that is, you know, the great good news of all of this is that it's simple and straightforward, especially mm-hmm. if you're someone who does have a, a habit of walking outside. Correct. Just, yeah, just absolutely. that one little change could absolutely. potentially clear up your dry eyes or, you know, mm-hmm. the other thing, as far as the eyes, you know, people are so used to hearing, but the ultraviolet light is what's causing my cataracts. It's what's causing my macular degeneration. Mm. It's, it's going to damage my eyes. And I mean, too much UV of course would be a problem, but it's really blue light at this point that's doing this because most of us right. are in front of the screen. So on as from a retinal standpoint and from a cataract standpoint, that artificial signal of blue is too strong. It's not balanced. It's oxidating. Our, it's, it's causing oxidative stress for our collagen and the lens. It's creating cataracts. The macular cells are literally being damaged. Our, our retinal cells are being destroyed by that blue light. It actually releases vitamin A and, and it, it attacks all these photoreceptors and, and there's nothing stopping it. And it just creates damage and damage and damage. Wow. So it's just, it's a, it's a shame when people say, my ophthalmologist told me I need to wear my sunglasses to protect me because I'm starting to get macular degeneration. And I say, do you spend a lot of time outside or what do you do? No, I never go outside and I always wear my sunglasses, but their, their maculas are a mess. I said, you, have you ever been outside? You, no, no, no. I, I've always worn my sunglasses. And I say, well, you know, if you've never really had UV, how do you think you got this? <laughs> it's like, right. It's exactly. interesting. You know, most of the people right. who have worse outcomes, I, I, you know, I start asking a lot of questions and I've always done mm-hmm. that even when I started become before quantum, you know, I always ask about lifestyle and just try to get that information. But it is interesting when you see these connections. Yes. Ask these glaucoma. Right. Do you, you know, people who work night shifts, people who aren't sleeping, glaucoma is a lot worse. You know, it just start saying like, how much sleep do you get? I sleep with my TV on. I, I, I you know, I got, I, I, I'm on the phone all night, you know, it's just interesting. The lifestyle that happens when you see these eye conditions, it's so, um, it's just over and over again. And every day I'm like, right. there it is again. <laughs> right. So. so it's a very clear pattern. It is. It is. Okay. And let's talk mm-hmm. about those a little bit. We talked about, um, dry eye. So cataracts and macular mm-hmm. degeneration. You yes. see a lot of that as well. Absolutely. So cataracts will be, um, again, a lot worse in people who have health issues like diabetes. Diabetics will have much faster cataracts, has to do with the sugar in, in their body. And again, diabetes is very high, highly linked to a poor light environment with that cortisol increase at night and the blood sugar and yeah. insulin resistance and all of that. We have people who um, have asthma or allergies and they use a lot of those steroid inhalers, very big cause of cataracts. And again, if we think about allergies and asthma, there is a quantum component to that as well. Medications can create cataracts. So that's just from a, an overall health standpoint. But again, the lens is collagen. So we need it to be hydrated. Blue light dehydrates the, the eyes. We're not meant to absorb it. And the body tries to protect itself so much that that collagen, that lens is, is absorbing light before it hits the retina. And over time, it's just oxidizing. So the lens becomes yellow. Then it gets oxidized in all these different patterns. And you get these spokes. You get this, you know, clumps of, of different um, blur and, and the proteins are actually cloudy. So then they start to not see as well. Um, blue light, uh, lack of red light, red light can be protective. Now there are some studies that say too much red light or infrared light can be a cause of cataracts, but I think that's done in welders mostly when they're exposed to that intense, which n- nobody's really exposed to in, in right. regular, in the regular sense. But I'd say, um, blue light again, a big, big problem. And again, that dehydration. So even being exposed, which I didn't mention too much from Wi-Fi signals, you know, that's, that's a different frequency that we are not designed to absorb. So again, light is a frequency that, that, that we, we live by, but the frequency of, of, of Wi-Fi dehydrates us as well. So just being with blue light screens and Wi-Fi, you know, all of that is going to dehydrate the body cause damage to our lens. So that can create cataracts. And, um, and again, melatonin is protective. Vitamin D is protective. All of those things. Mitochondria need to be working well. The macula has, um, 
Interesting that the macula is the most sensitive part of the retina. That's how we see in the, in the center of our eyes. It's the most detailed vision. It has the highest level of cones or photoreceptors. And if you can imagine every single time light hits a photoreceptor, it has to be regenerated. You know that. So when we're staring at blue light all day, those photoreceptors, like I said before, they get damaged. They, they need to get, get regenerated. So they start um, releasing waste products. And the retina has, right in the macula, there's no blood vessels in the macula. So the, the macula or the fovea gets its blood supply from the layer underneath. It's called the choroid right underneath the retina. And it's full of the blood vessels, and that's what gives it its nutrients. And it also has a whole layer of melanin. And melanin has been shown to protect the retina. So people who have lighter eyes have lower melanin. They have a higher risk of macular degeneration, which is interesting because melanin also has, which is from UV light, which we need that UV light to make melanin. But melanin has been shown to actually provide energy with water to the retina, which is a whole other whole other story. Oh, oh. <laughs> right? Whole okay, other I'm ready to do hole. a whole other podcast on that. <laughs> but anyway, so we need melanin. We need we need that ultraviolet light to, to also for nitric oxide mm-hmm. to keep our blood vessels flowing. When we're lacking that ultraviolet light, we're lacking red to balance out the blue. We're lacking infrared, which which again uh, just destroys our um, water, that, that exclusion zone water. We need a lot of that water in the macula for that voltage. We need water to be good. We need our mitochondria to be working. The retinal cells, those photoreceptors, have a, a ton of mitochondria because the amount of energy that's constantly required. So blue light's going to create these waste products or drusen that falls out of these cells. And the, the, the pigment layer doesn't have enough ability to regenerate or, or process it. So these drusen deposits just get stuck. And then the architecture of the macula starts getting damaged, and, and then we start to get blurry. And that's more of a dry, um, dry uh, macular degeneration. When we talk about wet, that's when the body not only has drusen, but it's cracking the membrane, and then blood gets in there, and then new, new blood vessels can form because the body's just trying so hard to protect itself, but there's just so much damage from all of this light, and also from you know inflammatory conditions and whatnot. So it's a big problem. Um, and it used to be everybody also always said it was UV light. But again, we're not really getting that UV exposure anymore. Um, so there's everything I just said, nitric oxide. Did I forget anything? I think I think that covers And melatonin. Melatonin actually um, actually regenerates our photoreceptors while we're sleeping. Our cones need melatonin. So if we're not sleeping, no matter what we do, if we're not sleeping, we're not healing. So again, sleep is really important. Vitamin D, there's vitamin D receptors, super important. And we also need DHA, which is our um, cell membranes. It's that healthy fat. So I don't talk too much about food, but we, we need that DHA yeah. in our diet, our fish, um, health, you know, grass-fed animal meats, things like that, um, and fish that actually protect our cell membranes. So that vitamin A that gets released by blue light, the DHA, all of that is damaging those cells. And it's very, that's just what happens. And then there's this cycle where this oxidative stress keeps happening. And macular wow. degeneration is tough. You know, once it's, once those cells are scarred, it's, it's really, you know, you want to try to prevent it before it happens. Right. Wow. It's just, when you break it down like that, of just how <laughs> unbelievably elegant complex yet elegantly our bodies work and all of those different layers in the eye mm-hmm. all controlled by light and yeah, meant, really to, meant to work in a perfect synchronicity mm-hmm. if we just give it the right inputs mm-hmm. absolutely glaucoma too i mean all of it just so many so many different things what about yeah. uh because i've heard i've heard people mentioning this like in the last sort of 10 15 years detached retina that seems to pop up. People yeah, so, of all ages. Yes. I know like quite a younger, like it was, I think used to be considered like an old person's so, issue. Yeah. So, so there is retinal attachments are very um, much higher risk in people who are very nearsighted, people who wear really thick glasses and can't see in the distance, which has a very big quantum component to it. So I'm just going to mention that real quick. So when we're nearsighted or when the eyes, if you go to the doctor now, you need glasses for distance. A year later, you need a stronger prescription and a stronger prescription Mm -hmm. and a stronger prescription. And the the way that's linked to light is um, we actually, ultraviolet light helps us make dopamine. And dopamine is actually, actually controls our skeletal muscles. So when we're spending so much time focusing, our lens is contracting and those skeletal muscles are contracting. So if we don't have enough dopamine, that can stimulate the eye to grow longer without that dopamine so that the eyeball gets longer and longer. So then when light comes in, it's not focusing in the right spot. So we need glasses to make it focus in the right spot. 
we get glasses. Now we start again, focusing through it. Again, the eyeball just keeps getting longer and longer because we're lacking that sunshine. And that's actually pretty well known that sunshine can lower the incidence. But what happens with myopia is that because that eyeball is getting so stretched out and so long, there's a big risk for retinal detachments because those cells are getting cracked. Right. So you have to- It's the, the wrong retinal, shape. It's really it's the hard wrong to shape. stay on that cone, like a cone versus- Correct. A sphere. Mm -hmm. So that's one one cause. Of, I would say retinal detachments will be much higher risk in people who are myopic. Um, the other thing that happens is we have this ball of jelly in our eye, this vitreous, this where we get those floaters. And that vitreous is a ball of collagen. It's a ball of collagen with hyaluronic acid and water. So what happens? Dehydrate, dehydration, right? So if that water and that the collagen separates from the hyaluronic acid, now you have these floaters in the eye, which are okay for the most part. A lot of people have them. But what can happen is that ball of jelly is so sticky, it can pull away from the retina and it can take a piece of retina with it and that causes detachments. So floaters, um. while floaters can be a normal part of aging, we see it a lot. You see it in people who are myopic because, again, that eyeball mm -hmm. is stretched out. But I, but blue light, I mean, the, the body's trying to protect itself. So the, that vitreous is a big ball of fluid that's protecting light or slowing down light before it gets to the retina. So if we have too much of that blue light, we're stimulating all this oxidative stress and dehydration, and it can create that, you know, pulling at an earlier age, and that can lead to retinal detachments as well. And we also need melanin to be intact. So, um, when melanin is dysregulated, because we're lacking that ultraviolet light, melanin is what protects the entire retina. And again, that's what gets with the water, melanin and mm -hmm. water. So again, dehydration or mitochondrial function needs to be right for water and, um, and that, you know, melanin to be made and melatonin, you know, all of those things. Again, everything is linked again. Of course, trauma can cause retinal detachments. That's something different. But from a quantum standpoint, I would say those are the, those are the causes that I could think of that would be linked to retinal detachments. Wow. Mm -hmm. So floaters, and that's kind of like, I used to get those all the time. And now that you mention it, I don't anymore. Oh. <laughs> but that's like when you, it's sort of like something's kind of seems to be floating in the middle distance, mm -hmm. kind of a little bit off right. to the you side. Right. You can see, like you There's think like it's a, a fly. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you think it's a fly. You go to look at it and it keeps moving. Um, if it's yeah. a very bright background, you can see them a lot. And those are the collagen fibers that are just floating around like a snow globe. Mm. They're, they're like a snow globe. And when they float past the retina, you see the shadows being cast on the retina. So for the okay, most part... Okay, so the floaters yeah. are shadows of collagen fibers. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's floating. Exactly. Because they mm -hmm. do... Yeah, like it's a fuzzy... Like it's not there's a all different clear, shades, sometimes yeah, right. And we can see it under the microscope. There's sometimes they're, they're like mm -hmm. these translucent little floaters. Sometimes they're thicker. Um, and when we take pictures of the back of the eye, and people have really thick floaters, you can see the shadows. So people can see that pretty easily um, when they have them. And again, the, the risk for floaters is if it ends up uh, pulling, if that jelly is right. actually pulling away from the retina. Now, floaters. People say, "What can I do for floaters?" Um, I mean, some floaters can also happen from. Uh, from poor, uh, from inflammation. There are inflammatory conditions. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a doctor, Jerry Tennant, who I, I, I see a lot of his research and I'm just fascinated by him because he taught me, um, which I'd never thought of the eye this way, but that that ball of jelly is also our lymph. Lymph is flowing through that ball of jelly mm -hmm. and it's flowing out of our eye. So the waste products that come from all of those photoreceptors, it's a lot of sewage that has to go somewhere. And sometimes if it's, it falls into the, the float, you know, into that vitreous and it can ba be backed up. And though that poor lymph flow is also a problem with floaters. So I guess if floaters are related to that lymph or inflammation, they can get better from some of these quantum things. But I think floaters in general, I usually don't see an improvement because once they're separated, I don't know that the collagen and hyaluronic acid can be, you know, come back together, kind of like a broken eggshell. Like, I don't know if that works, but they do right. tend to sink over time. So the brain okay. will start to ignore them or they do sink. So some people say I don't notice them anymore, but I still see them, but they're kind of at the bottom, like a, like a snow globe. Right. Um, but floaters are really interesting when so many people have them and they can be really disruptive if they happen to stay right in the center of the eye. They're, they're annoying. <laughs> right. Yeah. It'd be hard to focus on whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. Right. Okay. Right. And then um, we were talking a little bit off camera about the one where it's like, it's like a floater, but you're seeing a rainbow in a shape. Yes. All right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you were asking about like the kaleidoscope vision. So some people the, will come yes. in and say, you know, I'm seeing these ka kaleidoscopes on the side of my vision, these zigzag lights, and it's lasting about 20 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, typically, and, and I don't want to give medical advice, but usually that's an optical migraine. So some people will, it's called a visual aura. 
and they'll get that first and then they'll get a migraine headache. But sometimes you can get that even without a migraine. So I hesitate to say migraine because for the most part, that's what it is. But of course, I always say, just make sure that's what it is and nothing else going on, you know, with, with the body, just that there's not, nothing new that's changing in your brain. But for the most part, your know, migraines, um, there are a lot of triggers for migraines, but I find that migraine triggers a lot of times, and it's the same trigger. So if it's an optical migraine or a migraine in the brain, a lot of times it's dehydration. Right. Mm. And what's interesting when I tell people, are, are you dehydrated? This, the answer I get is, oh, I drink water all day long. I'm like, oh, that's not that that doesn't really mean anything. Right. You can be dehydrated on that cellular level or that that atomic level. And um, drinking water is not really going to help too much. And especially we need our minerals. And if you drink too much water, you're actually diluting your minerals. So right. th that's that whole thing. So dehydration, again, from blue light, from Wi-Fi, from poor mitochondrial function, all the stuff that we keep saying. Um, sometimes histamine is, is a trigger. And again, histamine can come from foods. Histamine can come from stress. Histamine can come from um, dehydration and all of that. So and that's a whole other trigger, which does have its quantum component to it. Sometimes it's low vitamin D, sometimes it's stress, but even, you know, so, so there are other triggers, but from a quantum standpoint, I, I usually say, make sure you're, you're hydrated. But again, the hydration comes from more of this circadian stuff. Right. So, yeah. And that's like, that's, um, really helpful because that's true. We all, and you know, we all think like, oh, I'm not dehydrated. I drink water. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're fancy, you drink lemon water, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So explain to us how uh, being circadian optimized keeps us hydrated. I think that's a, that's yes. a great place to wrap up because that's going to okay. help with everything, but particularly the eyes, which it seems like so many of these eyes issues start with dry eye or dehydrated eye. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the mitochondria, which are our cells that are creating um, what we know of as, as making ATP, they're making water. So when light or, or electrons are flowing through that mitochondria, again, kind of controlled by light in a way, um, it's making water. It's making this special water. And when that water gets made through the mitochondria, it just... Um, forms this crystal lattice. It's just the way it situates itself. It actually creates this zone of a negative electrons and a zone of plus, and they call it an exclusion zone. And it actually forms around every single surface in the body that, that can attract water. So that's our proteins, our DNA, our mitochondria, you know, everything in our body is covered by these um, this, this crystal lattice of exclusion zone water. And it's called exclusion zone because it's like a battery. So that negative zone of, ex of water will push things out of it. It doesn't really allow anything to get in there that's bigger than um, smaller. It doesn't allow anything um, other than protons and, and, or you know photons of light and electrons to fit. Everything gets else gets pushed out. And we have this zone of plus. So now we have this battery of energy where uh, light signals and electrons and all this communication is happening throughout the entire body. And it also is weaved into our fascia or our collagen network, which our fascia, it, it covers the entire body. We have this highway goes from our toes to our head, you know, everything is connected. So if we're, you know, a thought in our, you know, anything, anything that's in our uh, brain, you know, goes right through our whole body and, and immediately it's, it's just our communication mm -hmm. and we need that collagen to be super hydrated. So when we're exposed to red light, that helps the mitochondria make more water because it releases nitric oxide from one of the proteins and it allows the body, the mitochondria to make more water. When we're exposed to infrared light from the sun, that exclusion zone water gets denser. It actually pulls the mitochondria together. It helps the mitochondria work better. And it actually makes a wider area of exclusion zone water, which again, the more water we have, the better. And when we're exposed to ultraviolet light, it actually just gives us free electrons and it, it, it generates energy or um, electrons in that exclusion zone water. So sunlight is actually helping our body create this voltage. And we need voltage throughout our body, but especially in the eyes, it's full of collagen, it's full of electricity. And the more water we have, the more of those electrical signals can flow properly to the brain and set up the rhythm of our day. So we really need that hydration. And again, drinking more water is not going to make exclusion zone water because again, that gets made internally. Drinking more water is just kind of flowing through our body, but not on that really um, that level that can exclude other things. So we do want to drink minerals and clean water and all of that, but it's that's not really what it is. We we need our light to make it. Okay. And and electrons and grounding and stuff, which I didn't mention. <laughs> Yes. So, okay. So let's wrap up on grounding. So we want it, you know, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say it again. It's going to be my new favorite thing to say 
our eyes are hormone making organs <laughs> to keep them healthy, making all the hormones we need. We need to be outside without sunglasses on and mm -hmm. ideally some of some of that time grounded. Grounded, correct, yes. Bare feet or bare skin on the earth is actually allowing electrons to soak into our body immediately. And it's just like it's free energy. And I just I just think of just it's just amazing because you don't have to have your bare feet in the grass. I mean, I don't like sticking my feet in the grass sometimes outside. I, if there's concrete, you just bare feet on concrete will be grounded. If you touch a leaf, you can get grounded. It's just this immediate um absorption of electrons of negative energy and the more electrons we have the more of that electrical signal we have the more voltage free energy reduced inflammation um the better our eyes will be the better our bodies will be we just as much as we can ground that would be especially when we do it in the morning we're getting the sun it's like we're just charging up our bodies you know from the earth and from the sun and, and it's just i just picture this light filling us up with um with all this beautiful energy so yeah, grounding is really important. Even just, you know, washing your hands is interesting. Um, I have the grounding tester. And if you run your hands under a faucet, because that faucet is connected to the ground, mm -hmm. you're actually grounded when you're washing dishes. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. But grounding outside what? is really what we're talking about. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And yes, so, you know, for all the people who have reached out asking about dry eyes, mm -hmm. or you have your, you have friends or spouses or relatives with dry eyes. Really, we want to say outside, grounded, in the mm -hmm. morning light for as long as possible, no contacts, no glasses, and, and mitigate mm -hmm. that blue light, especially at night. Right. So those orange glasses, which I know we've all seen, the, um, the orange glasses that block 100% of that blue light. Mm -hmm. That's how we block it at night. We want to lower the overhead lights at night because even if we have blue light glasses on, but we have all of these LED yeah. lights coming from above, it is still going to penetrate the eyes. And again, those melanopsin receptors are right there. So we really want to have um, lower lights at night, blue light blocking glasses. And we have to be mindful if our skin is really exposed to bright lights, we have those receptors in our skin as well. So darkness at night, especially through our eyes. And again, that morning sunshine, just like you said. Yes. Yeah. And that's a great point. Like the overhead lights that all houses, if, I mean, I'm, it feels like in the, I am going to safely say in the world, I've been all mm -hmm. over and everyone, all the places <laughs> have light LED lights in the ceiling. Uh, we want to keep those off. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, switch to lamps. Lamps. That are, yeah. That are, those amber know, bulbs or red bulbs. Yeah. Those are, yeah. Okay. The house looks so funny. funny. I was talking to um, <laughs> Mawish Saeed. She is a designer. So she, thinks in terms of not just circadian health, but beauty. And mm. I was saying like, okay, so we want to, we want to make sure those overhead lights are turned off later in the day. And she was like, oh yeah, you don't really ever want those overhead lights on. <laughs> they're oh. just, they're really not attractive. <laughs> it's so true. Hard. Like, it you know, mm -hmm. uh, so just, I thought it was funny from a design standpoint, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, one other thing. Actually, I see yeah. my reflection and I see the windows right behind me. Close windows. Here's another thing I get from mm. patients. I say, get your morning sun. And they say, well, my bedroom has, but my blinds are open. That's not morning sun. So the, the windows will block the full spectrum of sunlight. We need to physically open them open them or get outside. Yeah. So even in the winter, it's freezing. It is uncomfortable, but you have to just open it and you don't need that much of it. We need to get that first thing in the morning. That's a great point. And I love to make that point because sometimes people are like, oh, I can't do that. I won't do anything. It's like crack mm -hmm. a window, cracking a window, yeah. crack, crack a window, window in your car. Window. That's it. Yeah. Right. The you number of times my... we've flooded our cars because we always have our <laughs> sunroof open and we forget to close them and it rains. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> Um, okay, Valerie, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I think we covered everything. I think we covered uh, a lot. I think we covered a lot. I don't think this was like else. an eyeball circadian <laughs> quantum eye clinic. Thank you so much. All right, then how can people find you and how can they work with you? Because, okay. uh, they will, they will want to. <laughs> So um, I have uh, my, I have an Instagram quantum eye doc. You can message me through that. I have a YouTube uh, quantum eye doc as well. My email is quantum eye doc at gmail.com. I'm working okay. on a website. Um, I do have, you know, I'm still practice and I, I do work, you know, three, four days a week, full days. 
So, but I am starting to work with people one-on-one and they can't do eye exams virtually, but I can help from a quantum perspective, right. especially as it relates to the eyes, um, you know, through Zoom, Zoom consultation. So that I would Amazing. Imagine. So people could book mm-hmm. a consult with you and Correct. be like, these are all the things happening with my eyes and you can talk them through it. Right. If, if they, they want have- to exams from from their local place exactly. you could to take know a their look. history oh, and oh that's threat. so yeah. good that's right. so and that's, helpful that's a work in progress you know that i just this yeah. is all this is all new i mean we just okay. uh, had a beautiful qvc so yes absolutely so it is something that i'm offering wonderful that is great good news so we'll put that contact information in the show notes it's okay. quantum eye doc doc at, yeah. mm-hmm. at gmail.com Correct. If anyone wants to reach out mm-hmm. and schedule a consult. Um, yes. And you did like an amazing presentation for our membership with the, um, when you thank you, your <laughs> submission for your, for your Q, for your AQB cohort was like fantastic. And thank you. you shared a lot of it here. So thank you so, so much. much. Thank you thank for you, the Meredith. work you do. Thank you for being a curious person who was willing to go down rabbit holes and <laughs> listen to others and your intuition and yourself and you just be such a beautiful communicator and a bright shining light in the in Oh, Mary, thank you. The world. So, so nice talking to you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Valerie. All right. Thank you. Woohoo! You made it to the end of another episode. Thank you so much for joining us on this exploratory adventure into new realms. Your energy and support are building a different world, and I am so grateful to be on this journey with you. Take care and thanks.